Hello, everyone. Welcome to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, I'm going to do a rather unusual episode, but which may be prove important for civil service aspirants around the country. This is about a new book I want to present to you, which was authored by me for the specific purpose of enlightening young people about the charms and challenges of the Indian Foreign Service. Diplomacy has become extremely important in a very chaotic world today. But ironically, the attraction for the young people for the Foreign Service has been declining. When I took the examination in 1966, unless you were in the first 10 ranks, there was no chance of you getting into the Foreign Service. People used to take the examination again in order to get the Foreign Service not content with the IAS. Now it is very different. Even if you are 200 or 300, you can get into the Foreign Service. First, because those in the higher ranks do not opt for the Foreign Service. And uh, the post, number of posts available has increased from, say, 10 or 12 to 30 or 40 or 50, because the service has expanded. Those who join the Foreign Service are still good, because these people come from as many of you do, uh, from 12 lakhs, a million people take the examination. So even if you are 200 and 300, you are good. But it is sad to see that there is no interest in the foreign service. And I suspect, having been you know, training young people for the civil services, I have noticed that this is basically because of lack of awareness about what the foreign service is. There may be other reasons, other factors. I don't want to go into that. But I thought one way to get young people interested in the foreign service, which is a kind of mission for me, I would write a book, very short one. It is only 141 pages. And it's called Indian Foreign Service Charms and Challenges. I've spoken about this in various uh, institutions around the country and also outside the country. But I put that to all together in a, in a comprehensive manner. And uh, it has just appeared in print a few days ago. It's already available on Flipkart, on uh, DC Bookstore, as well as the most familiar Amazon.com. It costs only 250 rupees. And uh, some of the bookstores may even give you a discount. So it's not a burden on uh, aspirants. But whether you are interested in the foreign service or not, whether you are wanting to opt for the foreign service or not, my request to you is to read the book to take an informed decision. Instead of just being carried away by what you hear from others, because I believe that the Foreign Service is the most challenging and the most satisfying service. I have nothing against any of the other services. But the kind of people who require in the Foreign Service are specialists, not generalists. Because the Foreign Service is very challenging because the whole world is your field of activity. And every three years, you go from one place to another. Most unexpectedly, you have to shift places from Paris to Paramaribo, <laughs> from the most glamorous places to most difficult places. And you have to start getting operational in the first few weeks. And you may not have heard that country uh, two months before you get posted there. And therefore, the, you need a very agile, very enthusiastic, very extrovert people to be in the Foreign Service. If you are a bookworm writing on files, then the Foreign Service is not for you. But if you have the energy and the enthusiasm and the zest, as we say, to do something different for the country, I think the Foreign Service will present the most important uh, challenges and opportunities. 
Talking of challenges, of course, moving country every three years and uh, not having a, a stable life is sometimes annoying for some people. In the IAS, probably you move around, but you are still in the state itself. Here, you don't know where you will go in the next three years. And um, we have to become experts very quickly because in three years, you'll be moving out of the country, whether it is Washington or Beijing or uh, Moscow or wherever it is. And uh, so you need a very, uh, what shall I say, very diligent, uh, very agile people in the pharmacies. So that is why I thought I'll uh, write this book. What I have done is to make a very comprehensive survey of all that happens in the foreign service if you join it or if before you join it. So there is a foreword from uh, Ambassador Chinmaya Garakhan, who was my boss in New York. And uh, he later became an undersecretary general in the um, United Nations. And uh, he's still very active writing and speaking about foreign policy. So in that, he said very nice things about the, about the book. But the most interesting sentence that I, I saw in his foreword is, if I had a book like this, the one Ambassador Srinivasan has written, it would have greatly facilitated my choice of service. Because he explains how he was bewildered when he was selected for all these services together as to what to choose. And he went around asking people, what is the foreign service? And same thing happened with me. I had no idea what the foreign service was, except that I knew I wanted to be in it. <laughs> so that is the difference. And uh, so this is the idea that whether you want to opt for it or not, Make an informed choice, not do it just because you don't know about it. That is the only mission. I'm not trying to convert anybody into the foreign service, but to offer a, a broad idea in some detail. And what have I done here is to give you a kind of personal narrative. It is not an autobiography. I've done one already, autobiography wise. But this is a personal experience turned into an experience of people in the service. No two members of the service have the same experience. It's very different because no uh, two persons will go to the same postings. You may have two or three postings uh, together with somebody, but most of them are in different places and therefore you are not really linked up with all of them. And therefore you need somebody to really go into the experience and try to pick out things which will be relevant for people who are contemplating to join the civil services and make a choice. So after the forward, I've written an introduction which explains all the reasons why I've done this. That's mostly what I've just told you. Uh, but if you look at the contents, you will see that we start with recruitment. How is the foreign service members of the foreign service are recruited. You all know it is the same ex examination. And um, to uh, and after you have got your rank, then they decide what service you go to. You don't have much control over it. Unless you are you know, very high rank, you may not get the choice of your service. But uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, I think the uh, the right thing that you want to do. Sometimes you end up in the wrong service for various reasons. You may not like it, but you are there because of your rank and your uh, the particular situation of that year. So recruitment is, is very important. One suggestion I've made here is that the foreign service recruitment should be based on a more uh, specialized examination. Uh, because uh, foreign service, it's very important for you to have a good background in economics, politics, international relations, etc. But now people get into the foreign service without having given any attention to that, you know, engineers, medical doctors, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So for civil service, for the IAS, IPS, it is fine. But for the civil service, for the IFS, you need a different kind of uh, uh, background. And so what I'm suggesting is keep the preliminary for everybody. But in the mains examination, you know, the optional subjects, uh, those who opt for the foreign service should take those subjects and those examination may be a little different from the IAS examination in terms of the depth 
that you expect. But I don't think this will come about because the government is not going to accept that because this is a pattern which has already been accepted and it's being operated for a long time. So people are generally happy with it. And also there is always this concern about if foreign service does another examination, then equivalence between foreign service and the IAS will be disputed by somebody. They may say, oh, this is not the same level as that, et cetera, et cetera. So I have suggested it simply because of my conviction that instead of learning everything after joining the foreign service, if you have a background of international relations and philosophy I mean, uh, uh, politics and economics and history, that may be a useful tool for the foreign service officers. So that is, and then training, I have recounted how the, what the training process is, what are the things that you do from my experience and also how it has changed in the last few years. And um, I have suggested that there should be more training in practical things rather than lectures. Because to most of them, what happens is the foreign services are mostly sent to universities, districts, various agencies. Of course, now we have a foreign service institute, which is very, very good because very systematic training is given there. Uh, but more on the job training. You know, we now spend two years doing this and that. Instead, I would suggest that they be sent abroad immediately because that's what you're supposed to do. And no amount of listening to lectures that we have heard enough in the university. So it's better to go and become a third secretary and start working than the soonest opportunity. That's my suggestion. Then postings, that is the most intricate aspect of the foreign service because where you are posted makes a big difference. Washington is not like Ulaanbaatar, right? Or Africa is not like Latin America. So where you go and what posting you get is extremely important. And this happens every two or three years. And you have no control over it. You can make your preferences, et cetera, but the ministry will decide. It's a jigsaw puzzle. You know, the seniority of the person, the ability, his language training, all these factors have become. And very often also influence politics, politicians get involved and so on. So that should be streamlined. Postings have to be a science rather than an art. That's my view. At the moment, it's an art. Uh, the, uh, the Foreign Service Board looks at all these names, pick up somebody from here, pick up somebody from there, basically because of their personal understanding or prejudices. I was lucky to have got very nice postings, but that's not the way it should be. It should be more systematic, and that might be well. Then what I've done is I've run through all my postings, starting with Tokyo, Thimpu, Moscow, New Delhi, New York, Yangon, Fiji, the New Delhi again, New York, Nairobi, Washington, and Vienna. It's got a uh, pack, as you can see. So what I have tried to do is at various places, I have recounted my experience in dealing with policy. Because life is okay, I have dealt with it separately. So when you land up in a place, what is that you look for first? That is, what is it that you have to gain from that country? And nobody, you know, there is no free lunch. So you have to return something to them. And that is the main thing. Find out what you require from that country and consider what you can give it. That is what negotiations. Give the least and take the most from your host country. That's a very good principle, as you know. But it's always not like that. Most of the time, we need more from big countries like United States or Russia or China than they need from us. While in smaller countries, I was in Fiji, I was in Nairobi, where their countries want more from you. Uh, so a balance has to be struck and you have to figure out your agenda for the three years. And then watch the evolution of foreign policy of India, because you are the people who actually practice it. So there is a big difference between practitioners of foreign policy and academics who study foreign policy. The academics study it deeply, etc. But they don't have the practical experience of dealing with countries. And that's a great disadvantage for them. And therefore, they have to depend on practitioners to know how um, you uh, deal with these issues and also how they have evolved. You know, reading from a book is something different from being at the United Nations negotiating agreements. And that is a very important responsibility. And um, so, what was the situation 
of India's relations with Tokyo when I arrived there. And what was the situation when I left? Of course, the first posting I was a language trainee. I was only watching prime minister's visits, and various other things. I was on the sidelines. But still, there itself, you pick up many things. And by the time you leave after two years or three years, you then trace what happened in that country. And then you leave. You may not go to that country anymore. Of course, I went to the United States three times, which is very unusual. Uh, so you don't expect that. When I left Tokyo, I thought I would come back, but I never went back to Tokyo, even though I learned the language. So there are all kinds of uh, complications in this. And, um, and so that's what I've done about each of these stations. And as you can imagine, as I progressed, senior, more senior, then my responsibilities were more. And also, uh, more importantly, I came back to Delhi twice in the Ministry of External Affairs. That's a very crucial post because then only you realize what happens to all that you do in the missions abroad. How much of it does go into policy? Does it go into policy at all? All this you will know when you are an undersecretary or a deputy secretary or a director or a joint secretary. So it's important at least twice in your 37 years career, you should come back to India. It may be more uncomfortable because you don't get the kind of money you get abroad. You don't get the facilities that you get abroad. You get only those facilities which IAS, IPS offices get. And that do not for a long time. Because by the time you get your house, it's already one year. You know, so all those complications are there. So um, this is what I've tried to do. And so if you uh, read the book, you will get an idea as to what a young foreign officer does and how he grows and how he slowly becomes uh, a policy maker, not just an implementer. And also you have to, you can put in a lot of your inputs into the foreign policy making. In the old days, diplomats were mostly reporting on what is happening in that country because the government need a one reliable source as to what is happening in Moscow, Washington, or Beijing. And in Moscow, I remember we are, our main job was to get to Delhi uh, what the Pravda or Izvestia, the newspaper, writes that day, because they have no access. Delhi has no access to Pravda or Izvestia. So getting them straight on to Delhi was our first mission in the morning. But now there is no need for it, because they are reading it on the net, sitting in Delhi. So you cannot read anything more than what they are doing. And which means the responsibility has increased, that you have to study and send them material which is assessed and evaluate it with policy recommendations. If you just sent out these press clippings to Delhi, nobody's going to appreciate it. But in the, the old days, they appreciated it because they had no other resource, resource, resource material. So that has transformed. And the other transformation is that these days, foreign officers at the highest level are always in touch with each other. You know, Prime Minister Narendra Modi can pick up the phone and talk to President Biden. And the ambassador will not even know what they talked. I mean, a report may come later, but you will know only that they talked. In the old days, they did not talk. If they wanted to talk, they would tell you to go and talk, right? So we, your responsibility was much higher then because you were, the president has authorized to speak on his behalf. That is what the credentials letter says. And the letter also says, please trust him as my representative. Now, nobody trusts you as a representative. If the prime minister wants to convey something, he will ring up anybody and they're in communication with each other online offline and therefore you may feel that the, the the crucial role of the ambassadors are called extraordinary and plenipotentiary they do not matter anymore but at the same time the role has become more because to constantly prepare your leaders the ministry as well as the political leaders for dealing with these things directly. This is not something that they are trained for. And therefore, the role of the external affairs ministry and the diplomats has become more significant. And I'm comparing it with uh, the mountaineering. You know, uh, if um, uh, people, I mean, we always hear about uh, uh, Hillary and Jensen who come, who, who climbed Mount Everest. And everybody talks about Hillary having 
climbed the mountain. But Tenzing, who was his Sherpa and several other Sherpas, may have done much more in that exercise than what the, what the summiteers enjoyed. They'll all say, oh, Hilary has climbed Mount Everest. But the hard work behind it, who did it? It is the Sherpa. So I'm suggesting that diplomats should be considered Sherpas, not to extraordinary ambassadors, because their role has changed. And this has actually happened. I don't know if you know it or not. These days, when important meetings take place anywhere, some each head of the official delegation is called the Sherpa, not ambassador. Because who helps the summit here to climb Mount Everest? And you reach there, you push him up with a flag, he puts it on the mountain. But you may not go up there, you may stay one step below. But you are the one who has accomplished it. And that is the transformation that's taken place. So in the information revolution, as well as the speed with which people are traveling. And all these have put a lot of responsibility on politicians. And it is necessary for us to keep them well informed. Because in the old days, they could not make mistakes. I have heard ministers saying stupid things uh, to the host country. It was very simple, you come back, and call up the same person and say, please ignore what, the, what my minister said. Because it has sometimes happens because the minister does not know the nuances of certain things. So you could be corrected. But if these ministers are talking directly to their interlocutors, their opposite numbers, nobody can correct them. Things will go into record, which they do not intend to do. And therefore, it's extremely important that they should be fed with information with the pros and cons of every issue. And so, while the role of the diplomats may have, what shall we say, changed, but his responsibility has not changed. And that is what I have uh, shown, I'm not going into all those details now. In each uh, country, how I worked, what are the things I did, not in great detail, and uh, which will give you a flavor of what it would be like if you are in a post like that. And that experience before you join the service, even when you are preparing for it, I think it is going to be extremely important. So there are several chapters on each of uh, my postings. I've already written about it in my autobiography in detail, but this is not in detail. This is simply a, a hint here as to what the issue was and how we handled it. No general stories, no anecdotes, for example. Okay, then there is another, the last section is, uh, relates to things which you should know, like diplomatic homes. What kind of homes do you get? What can you expect from, an, uh, from a third secretary's home or an ambassador's home? Uh, how you fix it, how you find it? In Government of India has a lot of very good properties abroad. And uh, particularly the ambassadorial houses are really grand. Most of our ambassadorial houses is, they have 20 rooms and 30 rooms and all that and very nicely established because these are all bought long, long ago. And some of them are, are, are uh, you know, uh, very uh, historical, historic buildings, legacy buildings we have, like in the Netherlands, like Vienna where I lived, and then um, in Washington. These are not ordinary bricks and mortar houses. These are with history and the fabulous facilities, the gardens, swimming pools. And of course, you could not expect it when you're a third secretary, you have to go and hunt for an house for yourself, etc. But every occasion, wherever you are, you are the most comfortable. When I say this, I was in Bhutan, where there was no comfort at all. I went to Bhutan in 1968, and the first motor car had come into Bhutan in 1967. So you cannot imagine not much comfort you can expect from there. But still, you will get the best available in Bhutan and that. And now, of course, Bhutan is a, transformed into a very a lovely post. So that transformation I have tried to outline from my experience. And then, so there's a chapter on uh, diplomatic homes, what kind of house to look for, what will you get? What do you get in the house? Because we are supposed to get a fully furnished house with 
cooking utensils and glasses and crockery and cutlery and all that. So it's not easy to get all that. And then, but you get all that. So you don't have to pack too many things when you move. You move with your clothes and books, nothing else required because everything is provided by the government. That's a very interesting aspect of no other service gets you know, that kind of consideration. And the second is diplomatic entertainment. And that is another interesting aspect because you are entertaining all the time or you are being entertained all the time. So seven days a week, six days you are being entertained by somebody else. On the seventh day, you are entertaining somebody else. That is what the diplomat's life is like. You have to go out. If you say, I don't like parties, I don't want to meet people, then you are not fit for the politics. You must be wanting to go. So even after 37 years, uh, if somebody invites me to a diplomatic pa party, I will go because that's in the blood. You know? And uh, for this uh, diplomatic entertainment, we are expected to do, and many people may not know, but we are paid to do that. There's a separate allowance for entertainment. It's called a representational grant. So because you have to return hospitality, if you go to six homes in a week, seventh day, you need to give them something matching the quality of the food and the decor and various other things. And each country tries to uh, show, showcase their best cuisine, their best crockery, cutlery, everything. And we have our own style, we have our own methodology. Indian curry is popular all around the world. So even if they sweat because the curry is hot, but they enjoy it afterwards. So um, entertainment marks a very, it's a very important part of our, and even when their annual confidential reports are written, the ambassadors will write on your capability of hospitality. And there even the wife comes in, because if the wife is, a, is not a good hostess, you cannot entertain appropriately. So, if you read my book, you will also get some ideas to who you should get married to, men or women. <laughs> so that is the one in the diplomatic entertainment. Then diplomatic cards. You know, people used to tease diplomats by saying you are car dealers, because most of these cars have CD numbers. <laughs> but, but you uh, willingly or unwillingly, you become car dealers, because when you go to a post, you buy a car, and then what do you do? That car may not suit where you are going. So you have to sell, or the duty may be too much. So constantly, I may have, I don't know, bought and sold seven or eight cars <coughs> in, my, in my service period. And when you come to Delhi, you have to pay duty for your cars, where it is worth it, or you come to India and buy it. So there are so many options. So that is the chapter on diplomatic cars. Then immunities and privileges, which we discuss all the time. You know, why are diplomats given immunities and privileges? Because they have to function in an unfamiliar ground. You have to follow the rules, but all rules you may not be able to follow. There may be difficulties, so you must be exempt. You could be caught in a car accident when a nas local national dies, let us say. Then what do you do? Because you have the privilege and so on, but then you cannot completely escape the responsibility. So you have to behave in a particular manner, you have to help in such a way, but nobody can touch you, nobody can arrest you. Nobody can uh, uh, hurt you in any way. Because the only solution is for you to leave the country. And that is accepted all around the world. That if there is an unintentional uh, problem created by your behavior, your host country just withdraws you 24 hours, transferred out. Because we don't want our officer to be caught the local legal triangles. So it's understood all around the world, even among friendly countries. You expel each other or you bring them back to avoid any problem. Because if a diplomat is caught in any kind of undesirable activity, the reaction is very strong in the local uh, scene. You know, they would be, you know, they'll say this fellow has an immunity. So he must be punished. So two things, except either the government withdraws you immediately or the government, if the case is so serious, it's a murder, murder or something, then they will withdraw your immunity so that the local authorities can take action against you. Even such cases are there. But we are all very well protected. And if you don't have immunities and privileges, it is dangerous to live abroad. 
for diplomats because we you meet so many people, you have so much of information to communicate with Delhi. If somebody reads your message, what you know, like all the wiki leaks that happened, even my own speech is leaked, and I would have never imagined those you know telegrams or letters would leak at one point. But fortunately for me, nothing was found which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> it should not have been said. Everybody who read all these records which came out in WikiLeaks were very comfortable. They said, we, we, we do not speak in two, uh, two ways. We are very credible Indian diplomats. We say what we do and what we do, we say. But it's not true with other diplomats and so many of them have fought battle. But in our case, all the documents that came out of the Indian uh, diplomatic correspondence, there's not a single thing you are faulted with that you have been saying the wrong things to the wrong people. And that is the, and the I have explained all the, of course, the details are available on the net, but I have picked up what uh, uh, is relevant and what is absolutely essential. Then there's a chapter from the diplomatic wives. In fact, the publisher called me and asked, do you really want this chapter? <laughs> Why are you? I said, I, there's nothing wrong in that. What I'm saying is that the normal requirement of wives, wives or husbands, the spouses, because Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said one day, one day in parliament that in diplomacy, in foreign service, we get two officers for the salary of one. You know. The wife or the husband has a big role. They have to go to the parties, they have to carry on a conversation. They should be intelligent enough to explain India to others, not to say stupid things. So it's not only the ambassadors, his wife or her husband are equally important because what he says will be taken as official view. And then you have to, to entertain union training. You know, when we go to the academy, we, don't, we didn't even know how to use a fork and knife. You know, we are taught in Masuri. How to, how to eat with fork and knives, otherwise you will starve. And then higher and higher responsibilities, you have higher and higher entertainment responsibilities, etc. So the wives have a big role to play. And uh, earlier, of course, wives were not allowed to work in the missions abroad, uh, but now they are allowed to work. And uh, if, because we had many qualified ladies, doctors, architects, engineers, etc., and they couldn't work abroad. That was a big loss. But now permission is given as long as it's not a sensitive post, uh, wives are all working, all of them are working now, or they are engaging in their own interests, writing plays and poems and all that. And so always there is, a, there is a clause in your annual reports, which talks about the you know, quality and experience of the wife. So that I have outlined, and there's no offense at all there. It only gives you some idea as to what is expected of them. And even more important are the diplomatic children. You know, what happens to them? This is a worry that most people have. You know, if you are changing every three years, what happens to children? Every three years, they also change schools. They do. So my uh, sons uh, did 12 years in 10 institutions in different parts of the world. So you may say, what is the point? You know, you have no... All that are uh, disadvantaged. But overall, my own experience is that even though there, there are a lot of uh, uh, disadvantages because they are not in the same school, they may not get a gold medal at the end of it because gold medals go to children who have been there 15 years, 12 years, etc. But overall, education-wise, experience-wise, their education is superior than those of people who study in one university or one school. And um, so I have not come across any foreign service child who has gone astray or was not able to get a job or who was uh, not able to study because of these changes. But children are very adaptable. And uh, of course, many of them don't join the foreign service because writing the civil service examination is not easy when you are abroad. Because as you know, the civil service examination is based on Indian education, history and culture and everything is very important. But even somebody studied in the US, in US universities or schools, to prepare for civil service examination is not easy. So people ask us, how come your children don't join the foreign service? It's a practical problem. Because, but of course, suppose that one of them is very good in music or very good in uh, architecture. 
they will get a fantastic job without going through any competition. That you don't get in India. Here we have to go through a competition. So they find it easier to move from a particular training in a particular uh, area and then move into a job on the strength of your excellence. And um, so that is another thing. But uh, generally what I have seen is uh, the children are very successful. We have mathematicians, we have uh, physicists, we have uh, even wine tasters and designers among children. World class, I'm not talking about ordinary. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, resource. And you should never be worried about that. Because your parents will say, if you're in the foreign service, what will you do with your children? They will go astray, they will drink, they will go do this. Nothing like that. Um, because as long as you maintain a certain discipline, your children will follow. Then I have a chapter on diplomatic success. Because it is very difficult to define what is success in the foreign service. If you are in the IAS, you can say, I built this bridge or I built this dam. And um, all your life, you can point out to your children and say, this is the bridge I built. This is what I did, etc. But what do diplomats have to show? Nothing. Right? If I say I improved India-US relations, people will just laugh. Right? There's nothing to show that I have improved India-US relations. So it's very difficult to assess the success and failures of diplomats. And uh, that is a challenge. It's among the challenges. Uh, because if somebody does not know your work, he will never know. And uh, so when you are selected for higher positions, how do they know you are as good as the other person? The foreign minister, if he knows somebody, he will say, let's take him. You know, we have that experience. Even the present uh, external affairs minister was picked up by the prime minister like that. He's not a politician. But how many people get that opportunity? And therefore, success has to be measured by an overall impression. And uh, that is one of the major challenges in the foreign service. Of course, you get your usual promotions and you get your usual posts. But to do exceptionally well, your performance is not easily assessed correctly. That is the point I made. And then life in the life after the foreign service, that is an interesting uh, thought. What do you do when you come back after 37 years? And I can assure you in the last 15 years, I've never had a dull moment. Because the kind of experience that you have and the kind of life you have seen, People want to hear your stories, just that. So there's tremendous amount of opportunity for writing, speaking, uh, teaching in universities. I teach at least in three universities. And I go to every you know, civil service institute, go and talk to them, you know, try to help out, et cetera, et cetera. That alone is enough. From that, then you can read, write. Um, and you also can get jobs in the government, that is the National Security Advisor's post, Deputy National Security Advisor. Uh, then there are several government uh, think tanks, like IDSA, like the World Council, Council of World Affairs. All these places you are required. Who will run these institutions if former ambassadors don't do it? But then you have to work for it. You have to you know, get recognition. And you should know the right people. So you need to cultivate some of these. It doesn't come automatically to you. But there are several opportunities. I don't know any foreign service officer who says, I have nothing to do. There's plenty to do. And I find it, uh, I won't say impossible, but difficult to cope with the requirements that uh, people ask you to do. Even sitting in Trivandrum. If I was sitting in Delhi, maybe I would have been, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> completely covered with work. But when you are in Trivandrum itself, with the new communications, with Zoom, it doesn't matter where you live. And you can very usefully spend your retired life, uh, apart from reading books and talking to people and traveling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many things that you can. And the last chapter I call it the Sherpa. That is the new avatar of diplomacy. This is the first. I am the first one to use this phrase in this context. But it has already been recognized, and the, and the word Sherpa is used. Suppose there is a G7 meeting or a G20 meeting. Each government does not send an ambassador. He may be an ambassador, he may be a minister, he may be a civil servant, anybody, but he is the Sherpa, which means he is the head of the 
operational aspects of that summit everywhere. And uh, so we have also Sherpas designated for this. But uh, it doesn't sound very, uh, what shall we say, imposing. If you call yourself a master extraordinary and plenty potentially, it sounds very good because uh, you know people don't know what it means. <laughs> but uh, if you say you are a Sherpa, you say, what is a Sherpa? What are you doing in, in Paris or New York? You should be in the Himalaya mountains. So and that's an evolution which is taking place. And that I put in as, a, as the last uh, chapter. So that's it. And it has just 142 pages. And uh, anybody can sit or read it in one sitting. In fact, I got several messages from people saying, we could not put it down. So I read that book from 10.30 to 3.30 in the morning. Honestly, people have written back to me like that. So uh, if you have an interest, it is useful in your examination, useful for your future. I don't know how many of you are thinking of uh, the foreign service and uh, how many of you think what you need to do uh, to get to the foreign service and also to uh, survive in it and make a good career of it. So this is just a beginning and you will know more and more about this. this I have the, for, the flags of all the countries I served in. You can probably check out and see where I went. And some flags have changed. The uh, Soviet flag was different from the Russian flag. When I served there, it was the Soviet flag, the red flag. Or uh, even in uh, Myanmar, I think the flag changed. Uh, but others, I think, they have not changed much. United States is there. United Nations is there. And all that. So it's a open, frank assessment of the public service, and I hope. Uh, you will make use of it. It's available on such a on Flipkart, Amazon, and the publication publishers themselves called the DC Books. So you can get it anytime. And if you find it difficult to get it, let me know. I'll get it for you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, language is useful, but it's not expected. If you have learned French, it's a great asset. Then when you ask for your language, because one language all of us have to do compulsory. And you have a choice. I chose uh, Japanese. Just because I was uh, the fancy for it. I did not know Japanese before. But if you know any language, it is good to ask for that language as your compulsory language. And that examination you have to pass before you become a functional officer. So the training period lasts for about two years. I am in favor of reducing it. But one year is a language training in a mission abroad. That's very significant. And you have to pass that examination to get your first increment. You know, from third secretary, you become second secretary only when you pass the language. Then there are two other, other uh, tests you have to take. One is what's called accounts examination. That is to familiar yourself with the way accounting is done in the Ministry of Affairs. And the other is, is Hindi. So compulsory foreign language, Hindi and accounts, you have to pass. These are the three examinations. Unlike in the IAS, you have examinations all your life. You must be taking this examination, that examination. Foreign service does not have that because we don't have the time for it. So once you are confirmed and you are a second secretary, then you have made it. You can go up to foreign secretary without any other training. And that is an advantage of the foreign service also. But many people take days off or weeks or months off and then study, go to a proper university. No, they take leave and go and start do a course in Harvard. They're fantastic. That opportunity you have. In the old days, people used to be sent to Oxford University. Everybody went to Oxford University. What a fantastic thing. Now they don't send you because they say JNU is as good as Oxford University. So we are all sent to JNU. But that was not the story before. So, and then if you lead or uh, learn extra language other than the compulsory language, then the government pays you the tuition fees. And also they give you a reward if you learn more and more languages. So if you have the time and the inclination, you can increase your knowledge free of charge. The government will uh, give you every facility to do that. Because then you will get one more person with a new language that is disposable. So 
the only three things that you have to do is language, accounts, and Hindi after you have been selected. And these are the three examinations you have to do, and they are not very difficult. What do you mean work-life uh, work balance? It's the same in every service. In all life, every life you have to balance, you know, office with uh, home. And uh, in the foreign service, it's all the more necessary because you are in uh, uh, unfamiliar settings. You land up in a country where you have no friends at all. So you will feel very homesick. The wife will be even more miserable. So you will have to quickly get used to the situation and uh, make friends, etc. Uh, family life is very easy. I have not had any problem. People exaggerate before you join. Oh, what will the children do? Who will they get married to? Blah blah blah. But I don't know any family which has been inconvenienced. In fact, they have only had opportunities to get uh, the right right life partner in a very different uh, setting. My, my boys both married Indians, but they are not purely Indians in that sense because they have lived abroad. They are very different Indians, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, but uh, there is more partnership when you are abroad. It's not like at home when you say the wife do all these things and housekeeping and all that. But I have gone around buying chicken in the evening. <laughs> Who else will do that for you? So you are more involved in the family life. And uh, there are lots of distractions, political parties, uh, you know, alcohol, all these problems are there, they have to control, you have to control all that. There have been people, of course, failed, you know, if you become a, uh, an addicted to drinking or some other habits, then it can be very dangerous. But if you are willing to live as Indians do in a foreign country, you'll have the best of both worlds. You'll have the money and you'll have the opportunity to do what you want and go to a, an opera every evening or go to a nightclub every evening, whatever you want to do, which you don't get in India, or go to a new restaurant every day. So it's a matter of your own lifestyle. You can live like you are living in India, you know, eat your dal and chapati and live and make some money. <laughs> That's also people. But there are others who make use of all these facilities and use your resources in an intelligent manner, then you have a really good time in the foreign service. Well, that's a, the foreign service gives you that opportunity more than any other. You know, when you go to a place, you find uh, what are the skills available. And um, you know, if you want to make an IT expert by the side, go to one of those, or a modern artificial intelligence, whatever fancies you or Western music, or culture, or cuisine. Any skill you can develop. I don't think you can do it in, the, in India, in, in the secretariat. You have no time. Here we have to work sometime hard into the night, etc. But that's not a regular routine. But there's a certain discipline about the work. And you're not running around like that. And leadership quality, certainly. If you can run a mission in Japan, you know, you will develop leadership qualities that you never get anywhere else. So Japan is a is a workshop for leadership qualities. And uh, if you are an African country, there will be challenges. They may be some of them may may not produce the results in the embassy, and you have to, you know, because that national character you have to deal with. So whether it is developing uh, decision making skills or leadership qualities or different cultures. The best way is to join the foreign service, I would say. And the opportunities will be much more. Well, um, you see, what we follow is for uh, the compulsory examination. We, f we take the examination prescribed by the Foreign Languages Institute in Delhi. So you can imagine that it is French, Japanese, German, Chinese, etc., etc. The Foreign Language Institute's uh, standards may not be very high at all. That's what I found. So when I did Japanese for one year in uh, Japan, this Foreign Service Language Examination was the easiest in the world. I could get 90% of the marks. Because they don't know how much you can learn in one year. And this is true of many others. But uh, it's always good to master one language very well. 
even after you have passed the examination, keep on working on that language. And then you will get posted back to the same country, one advantage. And the other advantage is you become an expert. And there are many natural speakers in the foreign service or foreign languages. Maybe Chinese is the largest. The largest number of natural Chinese speakers are in the Indian foreign service. Similarly, the French. French is a very highly popular, you know, next to English. French is the language of the of diplomacy. And in fact, if you don't know French, sometimes you are left alone because there are always consultations in small groups without interpreters. Okay. And suppose it is a French speaker's group. They will discuss everything in French and you will not know what. So either you go away and find out from somewhere else. And, and so if you know French or Spanish, these are the most popular languages. Of course, Chinese is very restricted, Japanese is restricted, uh, but, and therefore it is useful because you know Japanese and that's a distinction for Chinese. But in the foreign service, there are any number of experts of French and Chinese. So if you have French, I don't think you'll need, I don't know this about this, if there are six stages, whether you'll need to what stage, I won't be able to say. But sky is the limit. You pass your um, examination, with a one stage or second stage, and then build on it and become a French interpreter. When the prime minister comes and he uh, speaks only in Hindi, then what do you do? So you need a, uh, an Indian officer who can translate from Hindi to French. And many of the IFS officers who are getting now very high positions are those who translated for Mr. Modi, even the foreign secretary. <laughs> so it's an opportunity. If you have an uh, interpreter's level knowledge of any language. Jump into the water, you will swim. That's all that I can say. Don't sit back and say, I'm shy. You will not be shy after a few months. You may be a little bit worried and scared and all that. But the way is to just jump in. And then you will, walk, you will, you will swim or you will sink. <laughs> But uh, swimming is, uh, is, uh, is, is better. Negotiating skills and all that. I had, I had hardly any idea when I went to the UN for the first time. But you learn it in five days, 10 days. See, in the ministry, nobody will tell you this is the work, you must do it like this, etc. Nobody tells you. You are posted as a country and then you are up to yourself and you and your ambassador. The ambassadors sometimes take great interest in junior officers, train them properly tell them what to do. And some ambassadors don't care. They'll say, you know, I have no time to train you. You have been trained by the ministry, so go ahead. So various uh, things. But, but if you are so determined that you are an introvert, then don't take the foreign service. Join any other service. Uh, because you must have that uh, mental ability to adapt yourself to these circumstances. And there are uh, poor choices, people who join the foreign service because that's what they could get and uh, then find themselves miserable. But I don't know any case of any officer who has failed when uh, he or she has the opportunity. They all rise to the occasion. Now see, for the first time in the United Nations, New York, the permanent representative is going to be a lady, first time in history. So she must have, when she joined the service, may have thought, my God, I'm shy. How am I going to run this place? So human ability to uh, learn, adapt, and become experts is much bigger than what we meant. We don't use even 10% of our brain power. Now, like this computer. This computer has, I'm sure, 90% more power, which I don't use because I don't know how to use it. And this, similarly, our brain does the same. And uh, so we have to develop that. You try the other side of the brain after failing in the first. So don't ever be uh, shy and uh, say that I don't want to do this. If you have the will, there is a way, as you know. So, but if you are so determined, then you don't need to join the foreign service. You are doing others, another service where you can sit and read and write and write, write on the files, and build bridges and so on, so, so many options are there. So since you are all in this, uh, the business of uh, preparing for the civil service, you should know about everything before you choose. That is the only purpose of this book. After reading this, if you say, I don't want the foreign service, I don't mind it. 
then you would have said it with knowledge, not out of ignorance. Right? That's the purpose. Okay? Thank you very much for the interest and I hope you will make use of this, uh, this book um, and uh, use it in your before you take a final decision what the service you're going to take. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.